Hi, I'm Sarah Schutt, Executive Director of the Wisconsin Alumni Association. I hope you join me for a conversation with Deborah Blum, author of The Poison Squad, this year's Go Big Read book. I know that you are going to be fascinated to hear what she has to say in this next episode of One on One at One Alumni Place. Say, but <laughs> I don't know how many good tickets they're going to be. But. So are you enjoying your time back in Madison? I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. Have you been back since you went to MIT? Yes. Uh, my younger son graduated, got his history degree about oh, a year ago. And so we came back for commencement. It was great. Oh, that's wonderful. It was really fun. Oh, fun. Well, good, good. And what is the, what is the must thing you had to do when you got to town? I'll go to the terrace. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And I sent pictures back to people I knew who all went, the terrace. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's really fun. Yes. That's really fun. Are you, is this part of a book tour? Are you on a book tour right now? I am on this particular trip. It's a 10-day trip. So I'm here, and then I'm going to Chicago, and then I'm going to Detroit, and then I'm going to Ann Arbor. Wow. And then I'm going home. Oh, wow. (laughs) Thank goodness. Are you going to be doing book festivals again? Are you going back to Tucson? Uh, I don't know that I'm going back to Tucson. I just did the Salem Book Festival, and for this book, the Savannah Book Festival. Oh, the little back in your home turf. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I've been doing a whole different set of things. I gave a talk at the FDA, uh, a day of talks at the FDA, and uh, at the National Agricultural Library. So it's, you know, because the book is a little bit food policy, Mm -hmm. I've ended up. And I gave a talk to the Association of Food and Drug Officials. And the coolest part of that for me as an author was that they had bought 100 copies of the book and they sold out and then they mailed me another 100 copies oh, wow. <laughs> oh. with the names of everyone I had to be inscribed, inscribed to. Oh, my gosh. So I was sitting in my office, well, in my office, wait, you know, painstakingly stickering up these books. It took forever before I got them back. I, d- I don't think about the hardship. It was a total, a, total a, sacrifice. A author. Right. <laughs> well, and the chancellor uh, mentioned at your talk the other night that, that we've distributed more than 7,000 on campus. That's amazing. That is amazing. Which is incredible. Yes. And the number of... The number of courses, wasn't it something like more than 200 courses? There were more than 200 courses. And libraries and book clubs around Wisconsin. I mean, it's so exciting. It is. Yeah. It is. So tell me, so you've got um, uh, this personal connection to UW-Madison. Yes. What was it like when you found out that your book was chosen as the Go Big Read book? So you could kind of picture me cartwheeling around my house <laughs> in Boston. I was so excited. And I knew the program because it's one of the best common read programs in the country. And I knew other uh, other friends of mine had been big read. Rebecca Skloot was yes. an early big read. Mm-hmm. And Dan Egan last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And they were just amazing books. So as well as thinking about the numbers, it was this was such an honor. And also for me as an author to be part of this amazing lineup of some of the best books I knew. It, it was the, one of the best moments of this year. Oh, great. Was it a surprise? Did you know it was being considered? I had no idea. Oh, wow. So my uh, publisher told me, and I was just like, whoa. <laughs> and then my publisher was also dancing around the Penguin Press Corner. <laughs> I <laughs> bet. Says, I, I bet. think, yeah. Well, well, we were thrilled. I was thrilled when I found out just because of the just the deep connection and the chance mm-hmm. to see you again, too. Yes, it's so, been great. So how has the response been to the content of the book, not only, you know, of course, from our UW community, but um, around the country. Who have you been hearing from? What what are people saying about it to you? So I've been, it's been a, one of the best received books I've done. And what's really exciting about it, I think I was mentioning earlier, I wouldn't talk to the food and drug mm-hmm. officials. Um, there was a, a hedge fund in Chicago that invests in food companies. Oh my gosh. And they bought copies of the book for all their big donors or big investors. So there's been a very positive response sort of from the official end of things, which I wondered about. And there's been a really fascinating response for people that I think are are one of the more important parts of this is that I want people, just regular consumers like me, to really be aware of this story Mm -hmm. and to really think about where we are with food safety and what we need to do to make it better. Mm -hmm. And then as always for me, because I like science history, to say, 
let's think about how we got here. Mm -hmm. And then finally, let's think about the way one person can make a difference. And when I, at the big raid introduction, Chancellor Blank mentioned that, Mm -hmm. you know, the power of a single person. And I love sort of being a standard bearer for that message. Mm -hmm. So... And the book will be a um, documentary on PBS next oh, year. Oh, congratulations. So it gets another life again, and that's super exciting. Well, and Poisoner's Handbook also was part of an American experience. That's right. This it? is another American experience wow. adventure. You're like the new Ken Burns. Yeah, there are right. The PBS is Ken Burns now <laughs> if, for books. If only. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that is really exciting. That'll be early. It'll be they 2020. They told it was going to be the kickoff episode of ne- next year's season, so oh. fingers Fingers are crossed that that really happens. Yeah. So, I I mean, based on what you're saying and based on my own reading, you know, it is, it's definitely, it's an accessible book, but it's applicable. There is, there's certainly the food and the science part of it. There's the political implications. There's sort of the business and industry implications. It's very broad based. It is. It it works on all those different levels because there's so many interesting issues when you start thinking about food safety. There's personal safety. That's the role of people who come up with consumer protection. There, there's the role in business, both in making food unsafe and safe, right? All of those, and there's the relationships between business and government, which really color a lot of the way I'm telling this story. And all of those are things I think we need to think about and be aware of. I should mention that I also talked about this book at a food science festival in Italy. Oh my gosh. So I've gotten, and I've done interviews in England and Australia, so there's a lot of recognition Oh, and it's being translated into Chinese. So a lot of recognition that, you know, this is a story that has implications for everyone, mm-hmm. right? How we think about safe food, how we keep safe food safe, and how we stand up for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's terrific. Any response from the food industry itself or from that business side? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I was relieved that I got a really good review in the Wall Street Journal oh. because I, and it's actually on the cover of the paperback because I thought, well, people who are really going to hate this are going to be corporate interests. But I got a great review in the journal, and I actually, to my surprise, got a good review in American Conservative. Oh. And, and so I actually put that on Twitter going, I'm really surprised about this review <laughs> because I was expecting some real blowback. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other thing that is really good for me is that I had the book fact-checked, mm-hmm. and I had the book fact-checked by someone with a background in history because woven into the book is American history. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about that when I started the book. I keep saying to people, I know more about Stephen Grover Cleveland than any other American (laughs) science writer, (laughs) right? So I realized that I needed someone who really knew history to go through it it and Mm -hmm. see, you know, if I'd missed a nuance or misstated some national event. And that was really helpful to me because when my publisher came back and they said, is there anything you need to correct? I'm like, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> the book is actually really solid. And so I think it's hard to attack it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because it is like so factually mm-hmm. correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what drew you into this area. You said, you know, you like you like the history, history mm-hmm. of science, science writing. How are you drawn into that particular area of, of journalistic I actually, that's something I got from my graduate degree in the University of Wisconsin. So I did a specialized reporting degree in the journalism school here back in the 80s, which dates me. And I had this amazing advisor, Clay Schoenfeld, who said to me, you have to go take history of science classes because there's no good journalist that doesn't know the history of what they cover. And if you're going to go out and interview scientists, you need to know some of that backstory and you need to actually be poised to say, no, that's not right. If someone says to you, I'm the first person to ever discover that, you know, ice freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. (laughs) And so then you can go, no, you aren't. So I took a lot of history of science here and that hugely shaped my realization of how important it was in telling stories of science. So, Mm -hmm. so part of if you look at the books that I've done, I've done four narrative science histories, mm-hmm. uh, all of them at the University of Wisconsin, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and I signed the contract for this one when I was still here. 
so that really that really informed the way I thought about the stories I wanted to tell. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's other things that matter to me. There's uh, what we talked about earlier, you know, a person who makes a difference. Yeah. I'm really drawn to that. And then I'm really interested in poison. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that also drew me to this story. Okay. Um, how, how do you think being a teacher and being a journalist – science writing is different than journalism and writing about other topic areas. I mean, some of it's the same. A good investigative reporter is a good investigative reporter. Mm -hmm. I tend to think, and I taught investigative reporting when I was here at UW, and I teach it at MIT, that we don't do enough of that in science journalism. But so there's some of the same, being a good writer, you know. So I also, again, going back to my years here, I taught literary aspects of journalism and creative nonfiction because science writers have to be really good writers. I used, when I worked at newspapers, I'd say the science writer has to be the best writer on staff (laughs) because, you know, there are people who are say, and you would get this, there are people who will just read a sports story, whether it's beautifully written or not, Mm -hmm. because they're addicted to sports. But when you're writing for a general interest audience, only a small proportion of those guys are going to be science junkies. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out ways to seduce them into the story. So the science writer has to be a really good writer. Beyond that, you know, science is a complicated, complex, fascinating series of endeavors, and you have to have enough training that you can go out into that world as a journalist and be able to ask intelligent questions and know how to do your homework and and know how to translate from the language of science into the language of English, right, or whatever language Mm -hmm. you speak. And so that takes extra special training. So when I've taught science writing, we spent some time saying, how do I take this complicated technical jargon and turn it into something that anyone can understand? How do I take this complicated idea and make it accessible to my next door neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. And that's actually a very useful skill set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you were here on faculty for 18 years, I was. is that right? And now you've been at MIT for a few years. That's right. I'm starting my fifth. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you notice differences either in how the subject matter has evolved or the students or the type of things that you're teaching or the institutions themselves? What are the differences? Well, you know, my heart is still with you, W. <laughs> right. So I here I was a full-time teacher. There I teach a, a short investigative unit that is only eight classes during the year. Uh, the students are, to me, the science writing students, uh, these are grad science writing students at MIT. Oh, okay. They're, they're very like the students here. They're smart. They're engaged. They actually want to get out there and make a difference. So that's a that's very feels very comfortable to me. Mm-hmm. One of the things I thought about being at MIT because there I'm a director of a program rather than being a professor is that being at a big research university for a long time mm-hmm. made it so much easier for me to transition to a research university, sure. right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean just uh, it was comfortable with the way universities work and mm-hmm. MIT and UW work on very similar Principles. They both are institutions that care about sharing knowledge. They're both institutions that care about integrity and truth. So that it was a fairly seamless move that way. Oh, that's great. Um, you know, you mentioned the four your four books that uh, you wrote while you were here, and the focus on on poison. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a topical area being in the MIT space that you are becoming more fluent in or more interested in, based on MIT's areas of expertise? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I know more about technology than I used to, <laughs> right? And we bring in data journalists and we bring in data visualization experts and and I've been pulled forward a little bit more into the 21st century <laughs> of different ta- technical applications in journalism. So mm-hmm. I was I organized a session at the World Conference of Science Journalists this summer in Lausanne, and it was on cybersecurity for okay. journalists, right? That's very new territory for mm-hmm. me, right? Mm-hmm. So MIT has encouraged me to sort of think both about 
the risks of technology and, and to be more acutely aware of them. We, we, there is more conversation there than at least I had in the journalism school here about AI mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and the, and the long-term prospects of job loss mm -hmm. and the way that, and, and I realize this when I go and visit family and friends around the country, that where there's all this ongoing conversation about how technology is going to change the world where I am. And, and it isn't like being transferred enough, I think, mm -hmm. out into communities that are going to see real job losses mm -hmm. as AI moves in and starts taking over things that we do in our everyday lives. Uh, we actually had one fellow, because my f program is a journalism fellowship program, who looked at uh, the ways that different bots and AI are replacing journalists. Oh, right? really? Yes. And oh, in fact, right. if you look at the Los Angeles Times, if there's an earthquake below four on the Richter scale, mm -hmm. if you actually look at the news story in the LA Times, it's written by QuakeBot because they simply have a bot really? that is, yeah, connected to the seismic uh, facilities in California. And when that registers, that quake in its location goes to QuakeBot, and QuakeBot just writes the story. So we know that's happening. And I would actually like people to be more aware of that, and I would like us all as a society to think more about the way that technology is creeping into and altering work mm -hmm. and our lives and everything. So that's a very MIT kind of focus, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the book. So I remember when you and I did our um, Founders Day swing for alumni events well, in Arizona, fun. it was so much fun. And I remember asking you, you know, is are some of the topics in Poisoner's Handbook creating other questions for you? And you said you were toying with some, um, some thoughts about food. Is this book the outgrowth of Poisoner's Handbook, or did how did Poisoner's Handbook inform your content in this this particular work, The Poison Squad? I mean, yeah, that's a great question, and it is in fact kind of an outgrowth in that I had been looking a lot at early twentieth century toxicology, and this this particular study, The Poison Squad study, study just popped, and when I started looking at it. It's a really crazy study because it's a, it's a federal scientist who decides to poison his colleagues, right, <laughs> in the interest of, of investigating food safety. I mean, no IRB in the world would ever do that, <laughs> especially today. But I started thinking about it. I read about it. I read the coverage. And I started thinking, so why would you be so desperate that the only study that you thought would actually shift the needle would be an experiment this dangerous and this risky. And once I started looking at that, I it came into this amazing, very troubled landscape of food before regulation. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I had bought into what I now think of as kind of mythology of the wonderful, healthy 19th <laughs> century and everyone in their farm fresh, super safe food, which was completely untrue. And that made me realize that there was a really great book here, right? Looking at how that changed and following Harvey Wiley. So yeah, it was a direct outgrowth in that way. Wow. Well, that's one of the things that struck me about the book, it, reading it now in 2019, is this idea like how preposterous it was that Dr. Harvey Wiley had to work so hard to advocate for food safety. And, and, and it just seems just unimaginable what do you attribute that to? Um, what created that attitude and that approach at his time where there was such resistance to this particular area of research? Yeah, it's really a fascinating problem, right? So some of it, I think, is the obvious one, which is that food, had ne food and drink and drugs in the United States had never been regulated by the federal government. Mm -hmm. So the country is over 100 years old. And the federal government has never said part of our job is consumer safety. So all of the American businesses at that time could do anything they wanted and did. Mm -hmm. And so why would they want to be regulated? Just the idea horrified them. So there was a very concerted business commercial pushback as Wiley starts get, making this idea that we need to actually step in and set some standards. And they actually organized some of the organizations that we still see today that are kind of coalitions of American businesses were formed to fight these laws, mm. right? And so there was that. There is, and I saw this with some of the food safety chemists, not Wiley, 
writing about the fact that there is something in the basic American personality that we tend to favor the rights of the individual over the rights of society. Mm -hmm. And so in Europe, food safety laws had passed. But in the United States, there was huge resistance. And you would see people saying, you know, is the government going to police my kitchen? Right? Is Uncle Sam going to tell me what to eat? The whole idea of the government getting into your personal life in that way was uh, kind of offended the basic American character. I think we still wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we still wrestle with the personal rights over the collective good, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're in conflict. So both of those things. And then the last one is that, uh, that we're really talking about a period in the first few decades after the Civil War. The mm -hmm. southern states had zero trust in the federal government. So you saw enormous pushback from the South in particular to any kind of federal regulation or legislation that would tell them what they had to do. And they, and they were very vociferous on mm -hmm. that point, mm -hmm. right? It's really, when you read the debates in Congress, there, there's that North-South clash that we still see today to mm -hmm. some extent, mm -hmm. right? So all of these things are not issues that have gone away. We still push back, right, mm -hmm. against these kind of collective safety ideas. We, we are pejorative about regulation. And we say that it is as, as if it's a bad thing instead of saying, I'm for consumer protection, mm -hmm. which most of us are. Mm -hmm. We say, I'm against regulation, mm -hmm. right? And, and we are very, very protective of the individual rights in this country. And we're still, to some extent, I believe, fighting the Civil War. <laughs> so all of that is still real today. Well, to that end, you know, I find myself thinking a few decades from now, are we going to look back and think, why in 2019 did they not see this about another topic that is equally as preposterous? Do you have any thoughts about what we might be seeing in a few decades as obvious? I mean, um, it's a, I hope this is a unique time in American history because we're in a period where a lot of our safety net regulations are actually being rolled back and rolled back fairly aggressively. So for instance, in food, there's a couple of examples I could give you. One is when the 1906 Food and Drug Act and then the 1906 Meat Inspection Acts passed, the Meat Inspection Act, so there were partner laws, actually said we need government inspectors in meat processing facilities making sure this meat is safe. Mm -hmm. We just rolled that back for pork, right? And so the USDA is now pulling inspectors out of pork processing facilities and saying, well, we'll just let industry police most of this. And they're doing that in tandem with speeding up the number of carcasses so it'll be much more profitable and much less inspected. The beef industry then came right up behind and said, well, if you're doing that for pork, why can't we do that for beef? So everyone is anticipating that we're going to see a rollback really? in meat inspections and those factories, too. That takes us back to 1905 mm -hmm. in terms of the way we regulate the food supply. So I would hope that even today, much less, you know, 20 years from now, people were saying, didn't you learn anything from the lessons of the past? Mm -hmm. Why we actually need independent inspectors to look at this, right? There's reasons why we put these safety standards in place, right? And the other thing, which, you know, gets a little bit in the weeds, but also in food, is in 2011, we passed the Food Safety Modernization Act. Mm -hmm. And that was a response to a big scandal involving a company that made industrial peanut butter. Mm -hmm. You remember? Mm -hmm. Lots of people died, yeah. right? Lots of people were sick, and there was a whole failure of both oversight and safety standing. And then the president of that company went to jail. I mean, it was like considered a very criminal activity by that company. So they passed this law that would sort of bring all the food safety standards up into the 21st century, mm -hmm. apply better testing techniques. All of that's been put on hold, wow. right? So, I mean, to me, this is me, any rational person would look at that and go, did we learn nothing, mm -hmm. right, from mm -hmm. all of the problems that led us to that first law? And, and then you can look at that across other, the, the rollbacks in water quality protection, mm -hmm. the rollbacks in air quality protection, the rollbacks in wilderness protection. 
there was a, a romaine lettuce recall. I don't know if you remember this. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that long ago, a lot of people got sick. I'm not sure that people, I cannot remember if there were fatalities, but it was a pretty bad deal, yeah. and they were pulling back romaine lettuce. That turned out to be fecal contamination from the water used on the lettuce, and that turned out to be a very recent rollback on standards for the quality of water that can be used in irrigation. So we're seeing these kind of rollbacks. I and mean, one of the things I love about this book is that when I go around the country and talk about it, I can thump the table and say, <laughs> we have this safety net. It might not be perfect, but it stands between us and all of the problems of the 19th century. In the 19th century, and I heard this at the FDA, food was considered one of the top 10 causes of death. Oh my gosh. We know that's not true now. Let's not go back there, right? (laughs) Right. Right. And so I think it's really important to say, this is a period where we really need to be paying attention and standing mm-hmm. up for the protections we have. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes your book even more important. In addition to a, a good read and historical and informational, an, an important statement and awareness building. Yeah, I people. felt really, when I was working on the book, I was more thinking, this is an amazing moment in American history that people don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then by the time I got to the end of the book, I thought, this has so many applications to today. And I didn't realize that. So I end up talking a lot about that, too. Mm-hmm. Well, so in all of your books, um, or the, the, the four, I call, I think the four big ones, mm-hmm. um, you know, you tell a historical and scientific story through the eyes and personality and experiences of an individual, right. you know, whether, whether, um, Harry Harlow with, with the monkeys, um, mm-hmm. or, or, um, Gellar Charles Norris, Norris or, right. yeah, and all of those folks. Um, and and that they all seem to be sort of these crusaders. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else do your books have in common across those topic areas? There's certainly that individual crusader theme. What do, what do they have in common? And what maybe do these gentlemen have in common? Well, the crusader theme is right. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm really attracted to people who plant their feet and against a lot of odds actually make a difference. I think it's good for all of us to know that. And I'm attracted to complicated people. (laughs) So Harry Harlow was a very complicated person, right? Mm -hmm. Which made him completely fascinating. Harvey Wiley is a very complicated person. And I love telling those stories because I think it's nice to know that we can celebrate people who are flawed and imperfect Mm -hmm. who make a difference. I I, I love that part of it. All of them then have some kind of a backstory. So Harry Harlow is the biography of Harry Harlow. It's the biography of the idea that love matters, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And Harvey Wiley is the, a biographical tale of Harvey Wiley, but it's a biography of the idea that food safety is actually important, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think in, in all cases, I'm attracted to stories that both have a strong character, or characters in the case of Poisoner's Handbook, but a story of... Uh, you know, a story that has some real depth and substance behind it and makes a difference. And the other part, I think it is, and this goes back to my deep love of both science and science history, is a lot of the people that I'm writing about are involved in building a field or driving a paradigm shift. Okay. So if you look at Poisoner's Handbook, Norris and Gettler are actually inventing forensic medicine in the United States, Mm -hmm. right? Harvey Wiley is actually inventing the idea of food safety. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really interesting to say, well, how did this field even come into existence? Mm -hmm. And, And where are we taking it now? And so all of my stories kind of allow us to do that. What can your budding journalists who you teach learn from those crusaders and your books and that approach? Well, when I'm teaching science writing, I, you know, I say to my students, the most important thing to remember when you're covering science is that it's a human enterprise, right? That just like you and me, what scientists really are, are people who are trying to understand the world around us. And that means that it's fascinating in the decisions they make and the and the ways that they try to explore and even the, and the successes and the missteps and if we and I think we used to portray science as kind of run by this alternate race of people who were smarter than you and me mm-hmm. and so we made it we detached it from the general readership and I think that's a it was a flaw. Mm-hmm. So I think all of my stories are exactly about that. Science is a human enterprise, 
And I don't think we do justice to what science is if we don't portray it in that way. So I hope they'll see that. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, I have to ask you, because these, the, some of this is gruesome, mm -hmm. um, but it's fascinating. What for you was the most or a most memorable moment during your research of the Poison Squad that you're like, wow, that's a good story? It was milk. Right? Milk? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is a great thing to say in, in the Great Dairy State. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although it was about how horrible milk was. Yeah. Right? And so I was reading, I had looked at what everyone knows that milk was... Uh, uh, you know, infested with bacteria and unpasteurized and un unrefrigerated in the 19th century, so that just made it dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact that they used formaldehyde to preserve milk, right? And the fact, and when I realized, and I was searching around, I use ProQuest historical newspapers a lot because I want to look at contemporary coverage, and I realized that there were things called embalmed milk scandals, because formaldehyde was a very well-known embalming fluid, right? Mm -hmm. It was the number one choice in the Civil War. So when they started having children dying around the country because they had too much formaldehyde in the milk, and you would see these headlines, embalm milk scandal in Omaha, wow. um, or there was a, a summer in Indianapolis where 400 children died from this formaldehyde-laced milk. I was just shocked. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was such a great example. Uh, and none of this was illegal, I should say. So this was such a great example of food before the that age. And then the other thing I, I guess I should mention, I was down at the Library of Congress. Wiley's papers, most of them are at the Library of Congress. So I was spending weeks in this archive. And I tweeted something about the archive. And a librarian over in a different building who worked with their historical cookbook section wrote me on Twitter and said, you should come over here, oh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because we have all, it was great. Uh -huh. Librarians are the most amazing people, right? <laughs> and so I went over there and I discovered, and I hadn't known this either, that cookbook writers in the late 19th and early 20th century had to actually put in their recipes. This recipe calls for pepper. Be aware that pepper is rarely actually pepper. This oh. recipe calls for coffee. Be aware that coffee is often dyed sawdust, right? And you see these in these cookbooks. And so I went to the library. I went to this library and I said, could you find me the cookbooks, right? And so they did a whole search and I had this whole list of cookbooks in which you, it was so amazing. Fascinating. Yeah, to realize that and to realize how much cookbook authors saw themselves as important educators, which they were, of mm -hmm. women at that time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like the um, Fanny Farmer's first famous cookbook mm -hmm. has a whole chapter on chemistry in it. Right. I mean, amazing. It's, it's just amazing. Yeah. So, so those moments of discovery, the horrible ones like formaldehyde, the amazing ones like the cookbooks. I love the research process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more fun than writing. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so Dr. Wiley passed away in 1930. Right. So he had seen the laws pass. Um, a lot has happened. If he were here today, um, I'm curious. What would you want to ask him that you couldn't find out in your research? Well, there were, I mean, I asked my, yeah, that's a good question. I think I would want to ask him if how he felt about those behind the scenes business handshakes at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I have, would like to ask him, and he would not like this question, <laughs> if he felt like being a crusader all the time was really effective. Because one of the things that struck me, as after the 1906 law gets passed, and he is part of the team that's trying to figure out how to implement it, he's so rigid and unbudging about what he thinks is right, so he never negotiates. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as someone looking over his shoulder in a judgmental way, <laughs> I'm like, just let the pictures of flowers go, Harvey. You know? <laughs> Concentrate on what. So I would actually like to ask him if in retrospect, he felt that he could have been a better negotiator. I've always wondered that, if he ever second-guessed himself about that part of the process. Mm -hmm. I also think if he was here today, he'd be really ticked off. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, ticked off how? At, at, at the way the things that he thought were important are being rolled back, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and 
People say to me, well, is there a Harvey Wiley today? Mm -hmm. And there isn't in the sense, right? If, you, if I said to you, Sarah, who is the number one food safety advocate in the country? Who is the scientist who stands up for food safety? He's known coast to coast for his dedication to that issue. Could you name that person? I could probably name faculty on our campus, but certainly not at the government level. No, and I mm -hmm. can't either. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need a Wiley to come back, <laughs> yeah. right? But, but one of the things that, you know, I think is important about what he accomplished for scientists of today is he was a really great public communicator. He actually hired the first science writer ever at the Department oh. of Agriculture in the uh -huh. 1890s. He believed that the public, that part of the job of a scientist was talking to the public, and since I believe that too, <laughs> right, I think we could use more of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He became a bit of an icon too. He, he had a stamp, right? He did. He had a stamp, and the 1906 food law was known at that time as Dr. Wiley's Law, wow. which is really cool. Wow. How has your relationship with food changed since <laughs> writing this book and researching it? You know, my relationship with food started changing after I wrote Poisoner's Handbook. <laughs> and then I wrote a toxicology chemistry blog for Wired. And then I wrote a toxicology column for the New York Times, Poison Pen. Mm -hmm. And so as I started exploring poisonous things in the food supply, I became one of those insane label readers, right? <laughs> so I always think, there I am, the crazy lady in the grocery store aisle, reading down to the mm -hmm. very bottom of, or even I was at CVS and I saw that L'Oreal, this is not food, had a separate little envelope area where you could find out what the ingredients in their cosmetics was. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm the person who takes that and starts reading through it and sees get this, that there's ferrocyanide in some of the lipsticks. I'm like, whoa, right? And manganese and other ha chromium mm -hmm. and other heavy metals. I mean, people don't read labels. So the, it has made me a big label reader. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's made me, uh, the other thing I guess I would say without drilling down into f certain foods is that it's persuaded me to eat a very varied diet. Mm -hmm. Because if you spend a lot, a lot of time looking at low-dose toxicology, where you're talking about you know, materials that are there at a part per million or part per billion level, mm -hmm. I mean, people don't realize that some of those part per billion, part per million levels are actually really dangerous, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you took arsenic, which is a naturally occurring element but is in groundwater, including here in Wisconsin, and you look, and the EPA limit on that is 10 parts per billion, you know, once you get a little bit above 10 parts per billion, if you went even to 50 parts per billion, you start seeing serious damage to the circulatory system, mm -hmm. right? It's a very dangerous thing. But so the thing about that is you just don't want to be exposed to it every day, oh, right? Sure. Almost all of these compounds will cycle out of your body, I mean, barring lead or something, in a day or two. So the trick is to eat a really varied diet, right? Mm -hmm. Don't eat the same foods every day. If you're eating a food and it's a processed food and you know there's industrial chemicals in it, then just don't eat it every day. Give your body a chance not to be beat up every single day by some of those compounds, mm -hmm. right? So I'm mm -hmm. you know, fond of going out and saying, you know, variety is really the spice of life. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. So are there still stories you want to tell about poison? Oh, always, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm, it's really frustrating to me about having this job, which is, uh, an administrative job at MIT, and so I don't have time to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. Even when I was down at the FDA, they were talking about the new rise and using heavy metals to dye spices like uh, turmeric and saffron, and they're starting to detect lead chromate, which was oh. used in the 19th century to make them more yellow, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, someone needs to tell that story. People need to know that. I, I mean, I really miss my my Wired blog and my New York Times column. <laughs> so there are those. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as for another book, yeah, I don't have that yet. And I'm really enjoying not having it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because once you sign a book contract, there's a clock that's always ticking in your head, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm in, I don't miss the tick at all. <laughs> sure, right? sure. 
Well, Deb, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. It's such a pleasure. It has been so fun and so illuminating too. Thank you. Um, If I could ask you one more question, do you mind signing my my copy of The Poison Squad? I would absolutely love to do that. Okay, thank you. It's an author's favorite request. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed this episode of One on One at One Alumni Place with author Deborah Blum. Thanks for listening and on Wisconsin.